Althea moved with a dancer's delicacy as she prepared for a backhand, but dashed like a sprinter as her long arms and legs spanned the court to serve up some history. The trailblazing tennis titan shattered racial barriers and abject poverty before going on to dominate the court like no one else ever did. With a racket in hand and a fierce determination in heart, this icon etched her name in the record books as the first black American to win both Wimbledon. But how did she achieve this with odds and skin color stacked against her? Join us as we meet the first black American to win both Wimbledon and the US Open, a life and achievements that transcended sports and are part of the annals of African-American history. From her roots as a sharecropper's daughter in the cotton fields of South Carolina, to her emergence as the unlikely queen of the highly segregated tennis world in the 1950s, her story is a complex tale of race, class, and gender. So, let's meet the first black American to win both Wimbledon and the US Open. People often cite Arthur Ashe as the first African American to win Wimbledon in 1975, but that is farther from the truth. He was indeed the first African American male to win the men's singles title, but someone already paved that path almost 20 years before him. Althea Gibson, who was the first African American to cross the color line playing and winning at Wimbledon and at the U.S. Nationals, the precursor of the U.S. Open. Gibson was born in Silver, South Carolina on August 25, 1927. At the age of three, her father moved the family north, migrating to Harlem in 1930. Gibson was a tomboy who grew up loving sports, but disliked school so much that she started skipping classes at the age of 12 and, by 18, had dropped out of high school. She played basketball, but paddle tennis started it all. Though a talented tennis player, Gibson was a street kid who lacked the genteel manner associated with the sport. Her life could be incredibly difficult. When she toured with the All-Black American Tennis Association, she and her teammates were attacked with axes, threatened, and called hurtful names by spectators. When she mixed socially with the middle-class black bourgeoisie, Althea was told she was too mannish and unmannered to fit a feminine ideal. It was under the tutelage of Dr. Hubert Eaton of Wilmington, NC, and Dr. Robert W. Johnson of Lynchburg, VA, two African-American physicians who loved tennis and helped young African-Americans who wanted to play, that she flourished. She honed her skill, while receiving lessons in etiquette and the social graces, traveled and played in the segregated South, and even earned her high school degree. Althea Gibson was the quickest, tallest, most fearless athlete in 1940s Harlem. She couldn't sit still. When she put her mind to it, the fleet of foot girl reigned supreme at every sport. She played stickball with the boys, basketball with the girls, paddle tennis with anyone who would hit with her. But being the quickest, tallest, most fearless player in Harlem wasn't enough for Althea. She knew she could be a tennis champion. Because of segregation, black people weren't allowed to compete against white people in sports. Althea didn't care. She just wanted to play tennis against the best athletes in the world. Her skills were eventually noticed by musician Buddy Walker, who invited her to play tennis on local courts. After winning several tournaments hosted by the local recreation department, Gibson was introduced to the Harlem River Tennis Courts in 1941. Incredibly, just a year after picking up a racket for the first time, she won a local tournament sponsored by the American Tennis Association, an African-American organization established to promote and sponsor tournaments for black players. She picked up two more ATA titles in 1944 and 1945. Then, after losing one title in 1946, Gibson won 10 straight championships from 1947 to 1956. Amidst this winning streak, she made history as the first African-American tennis player to compete at both the U.S. National Championships in 1950 and Wimbledon in 1951. Gibson's success at those ATA tournaments paved the way for her to attend Florida A&M University on a sports scholarship. She graduated from the school in 1953, but it was a struggle for her to get by. At one point, she even thought of leaving sports altogether to join the U.S. Army. A good deal of her frustration had to do with the fact that so much of the tennis world was closed off to her. The white-dominated, white-managed sport was segregated in the United States, as was the world around it. The breaking point came in 1950, when Alice Marble, a former tennis number one herself, wrote a piece in American Lawn Tennis magazine lambasting her sport 
for denying a player of Gibson's caliber to compete in the world's best tournaments. Marble's article caught notice, and by 1952, just one year after becoming the first black player to compete at Wimbledon, Gibson was a top 10 player in the United States. She went on to climb even higher, to number seven by 1953. In 1955, as she scaled higher, Gibson and her game were sponsored by the United States Lawn Tennis Association, which sent her around the world on a State Department tour that saw her compete in places like India, Pakistan, and Burma. Measuring five feet, 11 inches, and possessing superb power and athletic skill, Gibson seemed destined for bigger victories. In 1956, it all came together when she won the French Open. In July 1957, Gibson won Wimbledon, defeating Darlene Hard, 6-3, 6-2. In September 1957, she won the U.S. Open, and the Associated Press named her Female Athlete of the Year in 1957 and 1958. During the 1950s, Gibson won 56 singles and doubles titles, including 11 major titles before turning pro in 1959. Gibson downplayed her pioneering role, stating in her 1958 autobiography, I always wanted to be somebody, that she never saw herself as a crusader. She clarified that she didn't actively advocate for any cause, including the rights of African Americans in the United States. When Althea Gibson won the Wimbledon Championships on July 6, 1957, and became the first black athlete to capture tennis's most illustrious title, she was roundly honored and celebrated. Queen Elizabeth II presented her with the winner's trophy. At the Wimbledon Ball that night, Gibson danced with men's champion Lou Hode and the Duke of Devonshire and sang with the band. She later wrote in her 1958 memoir, I Always Wanted to Be Somebody, that it had been a wonderful evening and a wonderful day. Indeed, any Wimbledon winner would have shared her sentiment, basking in the glory of such a triumphant experience. But Gibson's encounters with racism in and out of sports gave her special, if fleeting, satisfaction as she stood atop the tennis world. In 1959, she signed to play a series of exhibition matches against Fagaros before Harlem Globetrotter basketball games. When the tour ended, she won the singles and doubles titles at the Pepsi-Cola World Pro Tennis Championships in Cleveland, but received only $500 in prize money. As a professional, Gibson continued to win. She landed the singles title in 1960, but just as importantly, she started to make money. She was reportedly paid $100,000 for playing a series of matches before Harlem Globetrotter games. As we meet the first black American to win both Wimbledon and the US Open, it's important to note that for a short time too, the athletically gifted Gibson turned to golf, making history again as the first black woman ever to compete on the pro tour. Meet the first black American to win both Wimbledon and the US Open, who also pursued her long-held aspirations in the entertainment industry. A talented vocalist and saxophonist and runner-up in the Apollo Theater's Amateur Talent Contest in 1943, she made her professional singing debut at W.C. Handy's 84th birthday tribute at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in 1957. An executive from Dot Records was impressed with her performance and signed her to record an album of popular standards. Althea Gibson Sings was released in 1959, and Gibson performed two of its songs on The Ed Sullivan Show in May and July of that year but sales were disappointing. She appeared as a celebrity guest on the TV panel show, What's My Line, and was cast as an enslaved woman in the John Ford motion picture, The Horse Soldiers, in 1959, which was notable for her refusal to speak in the stereotypic Negro dialect mandated by the script. She also worked as a sports commentator, appeared in print and television advertisements for various products, and increased her involvement in social issues and community activities. In 1960, her first memoir, I Always Wanted to Be Somebody, written with sports writer Ed Fitzgerald, was published. Her professional tennis career, however, was going nowhere. She observed that white tennis players, some of whom she had defeated on the court, were receiving offers and invitations. This realization dawned on her that her triumphs had not permanently dismantled the racial barriers, as she had hopefully but perhaps naively expected. Instead, it seemed that these barriers had been rebuilt, this time behind her. She also noted that she repeatedly applied for membership in the All England Club, based on her status as a Wimbledon champion, but was never accepted. Her doubles partner, Angela Buxton, who was Jewish, was also repeatedly denied membership. 
In 1964, at the age of 37, Gibson became the first African-American woman to join the Ladies Professional Golf Association Tour. Racial discrimination continued to be a problem. Many hotels still excluded people of color and country club officials throughout the South, and some in the North routinely refused to allow her to compete. When she did compete, she was often forced to dress for tournaments in her car because she was banned from the clubhouse. Although she was one of the LPGA's top 50 money winners for five years and won a car at a Dinah Shore tournament, her lifetime golf earnings did not exceed $25,000. While she broke course records during individual rounds in several tournaments, Gibson's highest ranking was 27th in 1966, and her best tournament finish was a tie for second after a three-way playoff at the 1970 Len Imke Buick Open. She retired from professional golf at the end of the 1978 season. Judy Rankin believed that Althea could have been a truly significant player if she had started her career at a younger age. Despite entering the golf scene during a challenging era, Althea gained widespread support and quietly made a meaningful impact on the sport. In 1959, shortly after retiring, Gibson appeared in the John Ford film, The Horse Soldiers, playing the secondary but pivotal role of Lukey, the housekeeper and slave to Miss Hannah Hunter, mistress of Greenbrier Plantation. Lukey's dialogue was originally written in Negro dialect that Gibson found offensive. She informed Ford that she would not deliver her lines as written. Though Ford was notorious for his intolerance of actors' demands, he agreed to modify the script. In 1968, with the advent of tennis's open era, Gibson tried to repeat her past success. She was too old and too slow-footed, however, to keep up with her younger counterparts. In 1972, Gibson began running Pepsi-Cola's National Mobile Tennis Project, which brought portable nets and other equipment to underprivileged areas in major cities. She ran multiple other clinics and tennis outreach programs over the next three decades and coached numerous rising competitors, including Leslie Allen and Zena Garrison. In her 2001 memoir, Garrison recalled how Althea treated her like a professional player, not just a junior, pushing her to excel. Garrison credited Althea for the opportunities she received, acknowledging the significant impact Althea had on her career. In the early 1970s, Gibson began directing women's sports and recreation for the Essex County Parks Commission in New Jersey. In 1976, she was appointed New Jersey's Athletic Commissioner, the first woman in the country to hold such a role, but resigned after one year due to lack of autonomy, budgetary oversight, and adequate funding. I don't wish to be a figurehead, she said. In 1976, Gibson made it to the finals of the ABC television program Superstars, finishing first in basketball shooting and bowling, and runner-up in softball throwing. In 1977, Gibson challenged incumbent Essex County State Senator Frank J. Dodd in the Democratic primary for his seat. She came in second behind Dodd, but ahead of Assemblyman Eldridge Hawkins. Gibson went on to manage the Department of Recreation in East Orange, New Jersey. She also served on the State Athletic Control Board and became supervisor of the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. Gibson attempted a golf comeback in 1987 at age 60 with the goal of becoming the oldest active tour player, but was unable to regain her tour card. In a second memoir, So Much to Live For, she articulated her disappointments, including unfulfilled aspirations, the paucity of endorsements and other professional opportunities, and the many obstacles of all sorts that were thrown in her path over the years. Althea rarely spoke about her race or the struggles she experienced as the first black tennis player to make a major mark on the world stage. But no matter what she thought, the enormity of what she overcame can't be overstated, and just by existing in this world, she eased the way for future generations of great African-American female players, like Venus and Serena Williams, Sloane Stevens, Madison Keys, and Zena Garrison. It was 15 years until another non-white woman, Yvonne Goulagong in 1971 won a Grand Slam championship, and 43 years until another African-American woman, Serena Williams, won the first of her six U.S. Opens in 1999, not long after faxing a letter and list of questions to Gibson. Serena's sister Venus then won back-to-back -back titles at Wimbledon and the U.S. Open in 2000 and 2001, repeating Gibson's accomplishment of 1957 and 1958. When Arthur Ashe became the first African-American man to win a Grand Slam singles title 
at the 1968 U.S. Open. Billie Jean King said, if it hadn't been for Althea, it wouldn't have been so easy for Arthur or the ones who followed. In 1980, Gibson became one of the first six inductees into the International Women's Sports Hall of Fame, placing her on par with such pioneers as Amelia Earhart, Wilma Rudolph, Gertrude Ederle, Babe Didrikson Zaharias, and Patty Berg. Other inductions included the National Lawn Tennis Hall of Fame, the International Tennis Hall of Fame, the Florida Sports Hall of Fame, the Black Athletes Hall of Fame, the Sports Hall of Fame of New Jersey, the New Jersey Hall of Fame, the International Scholar Athlete Hall of Fame, and the National Women's Hall of Fame. She received a Candace Award from the National Coalition of 100 Black Women in 1988. In 1991, Gibson became the first woman to receive the Theodore Roosevelt Award, the highest honor from the National Collegiate Athletic Association. She was cited for symbolizing the best qualities of competitive excellence and good sportsmanship, and for her significant contributions to expanding opportunities for women and minorities through sports. Sports Illustrated for Women named her to its list of the 100 greatest female athletes. On opening night of the 2007 U.S. Open, the 50th anniversary of her first victory at its predecessor, the U.S. National Championships, Gibson was inducted into the U.S. Open Court of Champions. USTA President Alan Schwartz praised Althea Gibson's remarkable demeanor during the turbulent 1950s, noting her quiet dignity and grace in the face of adversity. He honored her legacy at a ceremony, acknowledging the profound impact she had on the tennis world and beyond. Her legacy lives on, not only in the stadiums of professional tournaments, but also in schools and parks throughout the nation. Every time a black child or a Hispanic child or an Islamic child picks up a tennis racket for the first time, Althea touches another life. When she began playing, less than 5% of tennis newcomers were minorities. Today, some 30% are minorities, two-thirds of whom are African-American. This is her legacy. Gibson's five Wimbledon trophies are displayed at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. The Althea Gibson Cup Seniors Tournament is held annually in Croatia, under the auspices of the International Tennis Federation. The Althea Gibson Foundation identifies and supports gifted golf and tennis players who live in urban environments. In 2005, Gibson's friend Bill Cosby endowed the Althea Gibson Scholarship at her alma mater, Florida A and M University. Althea Gibson's legacy continues to inspire and be celebrated far and wide. In 2009, Wilmington, North Carolina, honored her with the Althea Gibson Tennis Complex at Empey Park, a state-of-the-art facility that fosters the next generation of tennis stars. Other cities and institutions have followed suit, naming tennis facilities and gyms after her in South Carolina, Florida, and even Paris, France. In 2012, a stunning bronze statue of Gibson was unveiled at Branch Brook Park in Newark, New Jersey, where she had spent countless hours mentoring young players. The United States Postal Service further cemented her place in history with a commemorative postage stamp in 2013. The acclaimed documentary Althea premiered on PBS in 2015, shedding light on her remarkable journey and enduring impact. In 2018, the USTA voted to erect a statue in her honor at Flushing Meadows, home of the U.S. Open, which was unveiled in 2019. Sculptor Eric Goulder poignantly captured Althea Gibson's spirit, encapsulating her impact on the world. Gibson's humility and dedication to her craft shone through in her 1958 retirement speech, where she expressed her hope of having accomplished one thing, being a credit to tennis and her country. Her words and legacy continue to inspire, a testament to her groundbreaking achievements. The inscription on her Newark statue echoes this sentiment, affirming that she indeed achieved her goal. In a fitting tribute, Gibson will be featured on a U.S. quarter in 2025, a testament to her enduring legacy as a trailblazer and champion. Gibson married William Darbin in 1965 and divorced him in 1976. In 1983, she married Sidney Llewellyn, her coach during her peak tennis years. That marriage also ended in divorce. She had no children. In the late 1980s, Gibson suffered two cerebral hemorrhages, followed by a stroke in 1992. Ongoing medical expenses left her in dire financial circumstances. She reached out to multiple tennis organizations requesting help, but none responded. 
Former doubles partner Angela Buxton made Gibson's plight known to the tennis community and raised nearly $1 million in donations from around the world. Gibson survived a heart attack in 2003, but died on September 28 that year from complications following respiratory and bladder infections. Her body was interred in the Rosedale Cemetery, Orange, New Jersey, near her first husband, Will. Throughout most of the 20th century, tennis fans expected mainly finesse and timidity in the women's game, but Althea Gibson was an aggressive tennis player who hit powerful ground strokes and was unafraid to charge the net. Because of Gibson's race and style of play, critics erroneously accused her of lacking femininity. Althea Gibson was frequently referred to as the female Jackie Robinson, but she was uncomfortable in the role of a civil rights activist. Rather than joining marches and other protests, Gibson was content to use her athletic abilities to break down racial barriers. She was criticized for her decision, but she continued to rely upon her trailblazing athletic feats in tennis and golf as forms of protest. Venus and Serena Williams have continued Gibson's tradition of aggressive play. The Williams sisters are among the most dominant women's tennis players in history. The sisters did not hone their skills at exclusive tennis academies. They learned the game on public courts in Compton, California. Their aggressive and intimidating style of play made the tennis establishment uncomfortable. Their rejection of the game's insular and exclusionary culture has extended their fan base far beyond the tennis court. One of Althea's most famous quotes says the loser is always a part of the problem. The winner is always a part of the answer. The loser always has an excuse. The winner always has a program. The loser says it may be possible, but it's difficult. The winner says it may be difficult, but it's possible. Althea's mentality helped live a distinguished life in an era where it's much easier to just be like everyone else. Through pure sheer will, she created a path for others to follow in one of the toughest times to be a person of color, especially for someone trying to pave ways on a path where no one else has ever threaded. As we did meet at Meet the First Black American to win both Wimbledon and the US Open, Althea Gibson's legacy continues to resonate, a testament to the power of courage, perseverance, and grace. Her story serves as a reminder that even in the face of adversity, one person can make a difference, breaking barriers and paving the way for generations to come. How has her story touched you? Drop comments, like, share, and subscribe to this channel for more inspiring videos. Thanks for watching.